again, I'd like to thank Patrick Eden for the, for the invitation, uh, and it, it is an absolute honour to speak uh, at a memorial event for Rosemary Nelson, um, who I've always tremendously admired and who was such a brave, brave lawyer, and um, so I hope, hope to do her kind of justice in what I say. Um, in terms of, of my background on the issue, um, I've <coughs> carried out research over a lot of years now into prisoners' rights, um, and particularly, as you said, the rights of women prisoners and young prisoners. Um, and that was done with a colleague, a colleague um, Phil Scrayton. Um, we did work for the Human Rights Commission on the situation for women in Mourne House when women were held there in the Gabri. And then when the woman moved to Hydebank Wood, um, we, did, we did research there. It was published for the Commission, um, although I'm just talking for myself um, t this evening. Um, but I know that Phil would like to have been here and, and that he'd be thinking about, about everyone and about the evening. Um, and we'll send his good wishes. Um, in our research, um, what we found and, and what we've argued was that the fact that the state used such oppressive measures um, against political prisoners throughout the conflict um, has left a really deep impact not only on the units in which political prisoners are held but a really really deep impact on the whole prison system and means that all prisoners, political and um, so-called ordinary prisoners, uh, are subject to very, very harsh and oppressive measures um, because of the whole security focus of the prison system in the north. Um, and just in, in my ten minutes, as, as evidence of that really and of the human rights abuse that runs right through the core of the prison system here, uh, I want to refer particularly to, to the cases of two women, um, Marion Price, a political prisoner whose situation I know you, you all know very well and that, that many of you have been, have been involved in campaigning uh, for the end of her detention. Uh, and also um, the case of Frances McKeown, uh, who was a 23-year-old woman, mother of, of young children, who died in Hydebank Wood Women's Prison in May 2011, in the very same month that, that Marion Price was first um, detained in McGabry Prison um, on the power of the Secretary of State. Um, the treatment of Marion Price, as you know uh, only too well, since May 2011 shows in its very starkest form um, the power, the unjust and oppressive nature in which the state uses its power in the prisons in the north, north of Ireland. Um, and for, for almost two years, Marion has endured that, that solitary confinement that, that we've just heard that, that Sharon Rafferty is also experiencing. Um, first in McGabry, male high security prison, and then with their transfer um, supposedly on, on health grounds, although, although we know from prisoner prison inspection reports and from the ombudsman's reports that the very last place you would send anyone to on health grounds is Hydebank Wood uh, Prison because the health care there uh, is so poor, uh, so inadequate. Um, the impact of, of solitary confinement on Marion's health has been really well documented um, and we all know about it to the extent of it becoming the concern of the United Nations at an international level. Um, Marion's situation has raised clear issues relating to Article 5 of the European um, Convention, the right to liberty and security of the person, Article 6, the right to fair trial, and most importantly, really, Article 3, the right to be free from torture, inhuman and degrading treatment. And in 2011, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendez, called for an absolute prohibition of solitary confinement for a period over 15 days. 15 days, when we compare that uh, to, the, to the almost two years that Marion has endured and, and the, the months and months that Sharon Rafferty now, now we're discovering <coughs> has also endured. And the Special Rapporteur said that, that to detain someone in solitary confinement for over 15 days constitutes not only a threat to their health, but also it can amount to torture in human and degrading treatment. And it's to the absolute shame of the state here, the state authorities, that they're holding anyone in those, in those conditions. 
There were also times during her imprisonment, uh, and Phil and I saw it uh, when we visited Marion, when she was observed exclusively by male staff, and she was under the surveillance of male staff. And that's a situation which, again, is completely in breach of international human rights standards. So it's clear that Marion, as a political prisoner, has had her rights breached in a whole, a whole range of, of ways. Oh, what I want to do then is to broaden the discussion in a way that, that Patricia has also done to talk about the way that the state abuses the rights of all prisoners from the very fact of a person being held in custody. Uh, and I think it's really important to raise public awareness of the situation for all women prisoners particularly in Northern Ireland. Um, because what we'd argued was that, that the fact, as I said, that, that the prison system has become so oppressive and so security dominated during the conflict um, because of its concern to, to manage and to regulate and to oppress political prisoners, um, that women prisoners who are a very vulnerable group in society um, are, are suffering the consequences of that. And they're, um, as a group, although women do show resistance uh, to their situation, many women prisoners um, charged through the ordinary courts, um, are, are very vulnerable and, and experience mental health, health issues and, and find it very difficult to resist um, the power of the state. So as we know, women and all women prisoners um, in Northern Ireland, um, with the exception of, of um, the situation regarding Marion when she was held in, in Gabri, all women prisoners are held in Ash House in Hyde Bank Wood, which we've described as a prison within a prison. It's a women's prison unit within a male young offender centre. <coughs> and our research where we spent, we spent a lot of months with women in Ash House and we found that their rights were, bre rights were breached in a whole range of ways. i uh, just, just refer to some of those. Um, women, for example, were transported regularly in, in the prison vans, the horse, so-called horse boxes, with young male prisoners and they suffered extreme verbal abuse from those young men um, during, during transportation to the extent that some said that they absolutely dreaded um, the abuse that they would get in the van. We, uh, we heard also from women about the degradation of strip searching and I know that, that, that some of you in this room know only, only too well about the situation um, regarding strip searching and, and you've campaigned around that issue. Um, when we first visited Ash House, women, women were strip searched when they went into the prison, uh, they were strip searched randomly, they were strip searched every visit that they had, um, well, whether it was from a professional or from their family, uh, and, and all said to us that they found it completely degrading. The visits area is shared with young men, and again, women felt very much on show in that situation. We know about the inadequate health care uh, in Hyde Bank Wood, really poor communication between the prison healthcare system and the doctors outside so that women very often aren't getting the medication which doctors have prescribed them uh, to on the outside. Women punished, women with severe mental health problems put in isolation cells um, simply because they were self-harming or threatening suicide. Long periods of lockdown, at best we found on the very best day a woman would get 8 out of 24 hours out of her cell. On the worst days it would be 23 hours uh, in, locked up in her cell. Very limited access to education and training, uh, very few work opportunities for the woman. And women subject to very harsh discipline. Uh, many women said to us they felt they were treated like children um, by, by the prison guards. Limited support on release in terms of things like accommodation. Many of the women with no homes to go to once they left prison getting very little help with that. We, our findings have been backed by and echoed by numerous inspection reports, uh, reports by the independent monitoring boards, reports by international human rights bodies, uh, and yet the situation still goes on and women are still, years later, still in this situation. We know that women in, in prison, um, both in Northern Ireland and internationally, are a really vulnerable group. Many women end up in prison simply for mental health reasons. Because of this, the policies of care in the community, and we know there's inadequate mental health provision in Northern Ireland, um, women are getting into trouble and, and ending up in prison really because of their mental health issues. 
We know that most wo many women in prison have histories of domestic violence, histories of abuse uh, and, and violence against them prior to coming into the prison. Many women are ending up in prison simply because they haven't paid a fine. Uh, on, one, on one day's research in Hydebank Wood, we interviewed four women who had been brought in on one day simply because they hadn't paid the TV licence. And essentially those women are ending up in prison because they're poor, uh, no other reason than that. They had to choose between buying, uh, it was coming up to Christmas, had to choose between buying Christmas presents for the kids uh, or going to prison for a few days so that they wouldn't have to pay the fine. So I want to just finish by, by just saying something brief about the case of Frances McKeown, who as I said died in Hyde Bank Wood in 2011, aged 23. Frances had a history of mental health problems going right back to her teenage years. Um, she disclosed abuse uh, that, that came out, with her, her disclosure of abuse happened when she was uh, in Hyde Bank Wood. She was known to the health authorities on the outside and was under the care of a community mental health team before she went into Hyde Bank Wood. Despite the fact that it was known that she suffered from these very severe mental health problems, uh, she had extremely poor um, health treatment in Hyde Bank Wood. She experienced very long periods of lock lockdown, despite the fact that that made the voices in her head worse, and that she dreaded being locked, being locked in her cell by herself, because she said that she could hear the voices. Despite the fact that a nurse had referred her, a mental health nurse had identified the need for a referral to a psychiatrist, the prisoner ombudsman's report tells us that Francis didn't see a psychiatrist until six months after she was committed to Hyde Bank Wood. I want to just read you briefly from a letter that, Hy that Frances uh, wrote from Hyde Bank Wood before her death. She said, the voices in my head are getting worse and more violent. They run me down and make me so angry. It's like I'm sitting on my own in the cell, but there's someone in the room with me telling me what to do and to hurt people. I have to fight it so hard not to try to listen to it. At night, when I'm in my cell, it is worst, because I can't distract myself from it. All I can do is listen to the horrific things it tells me to do. Hell every day of my life. If I'm dead, it will all be over for me. I wouldn't have to suffer anymore. I can't put up with it any longer. I just can't do it anymore. I'm done trying. I just want to die and end it all. I can't put up with it anymore. It's too hard and too tiring. Just let me die. And in May 2011, as I said, Frances McKeown was found dead in her cell on the same day that a young male prisoner was also found dead in Hyde Bank Wood. What I want to argue really is that, that um, it's the same state that's oppressing political prisoners and breaching their rights and that's breaching the rights of Marion Price, that very same state that's using that power <coughs> that is also breaching the rights of women prisoners who've been through the ordinary courts. And I think really that um, it would be a testimony to Rosemary Nelson for us to fight injustice from whatever quarter it comes from and to whoever it's aimed at. Thank you very much. Yes.